you know, um, become, I, dare I say, a, a little bit of a friend over the last uh, number of years as we've communicated very frequently via um, email and such. And um, I appreciate that and value that. And, and I'm glad that you asked me to come talk today a little bit about gallbladder pulps, but then also gallbladder uh, cancer and, and diagnosis. So, um, you know, just to start off uh, to level set, you know, talk about some of the background uh, for gallbladder uh, cancer um, and polyps. So one risk factor for gallbladder cancer is um, the presence of a gallbladder polyp. And we'll get into that a little bit later on regarding some of the different characteristics of the polyp that would uh, place a patient at higher risk for gallbladder cancer. But some of the other risk factors for um, gallbladder cancer involve some kind of demographic factors such as um, sex. So women uh, tend to be at higher risk, uh, age like most cancers, BMI with uh, patients who are obese being at higher risk, uh, family history. Um, and then as I'll note, there's some significant uh, geographic variations around the world. And then some environmental um, exposures or habit uh, habits, if you will, including uh, tobacco uh, consumption, um, oral contraceptives, um, aflatoxins, which are obviously more common in Eastern uh, countries. But you can see here a whole um, host of different uh, risk factors. You know, as I did mention, there's a significant uh, geographic variation in the incidence of gallbladder cancer around the world. And you can see here that the highest incidence levels are in you know, South America. We all know that Chile has a very high endemic um, incidence of gallbladder cancer and also some areas um, in Northern Africa and also um, in Eastern Asia. And the mortality burden associated with gallbladder cancer, not surprisingly, uh, closely tracks with the incidence um, of the disease. Um, with, again, um, South uh, America, uh, Northern uh, Africa, and Eastern Asian being hit the hardest by this disease. Um, you can see, um, actually, if you standardize um, the incidence rate of gallbladder cancer um, by age and look at uh, different geographic locations, um, we all know that what really um, kind of um, uh, stands out is the extremely high incidence in Chile of 25 per 100,000 in uh, women and nine uh, per 100,000 in men, which is you know anywhere from 10 to 20 fold higher than uh, pretty much any other country um, around the uh, world. There is some significant uh, genetic uh, heterogeneity um, within um, gallbladder cancer. You can see the different um, genetic mutations that are involved. Um, KRAS, not surprisingly, a very common we mutated gene and GI uh, malignancies, um, but also you can see um, in India, a PIK3 uh, um, a mutation, and then in uh, China, um, a higher incidence of the uh, ERBB3 uh, mutation and that pathway um, being more affected. So, you know, I suffice it to say that there's not kind of one gallbladder cancer. There's probably many different types of gallbladder cancer with um, different uh, genetic uh, profiles and features that in part are largely dictated by a geographic location and also um, ethnicity and ancestry. Um, gallbladder cancer, um, at least in the United States and in many uh, Western uh, countries, um, is most commonly diagnosed as being, uh, you know, incidental disease after a, a lap coli. Um, when patients do present with symptoms, they can present with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, weight loss or jaundice. But usually that's in the setting of, you know, advanced disease, which is frequently inoperable. Um, you know, ultrasound is um, the best way to uh, screen for gallbladder disease, whether it be benign disease and or um, malignant disease. Um, and um, frequently, um, well, I would say not frequently, but in about, you know, four to eight percent of the population um, who have an ultrasound of their gallbladder, you'll detect a polyp, um, which you can see here. So that's roughly like one in 12, one in 11 patients who have an ultrasound will have a polyp. And then the question becomes, you know, you know, what to do about this polyp? How suspicious is it? You know, do you need to take the patient for a cholecystectomy? Um, can you watch it? 
Um, I think the first thing is you got to figure out whether this is truly a polyp or not. Or is it a stone? Is it sludge? And some of the things that you can uh, look for um, is a stalk on the polyp. You can also look to see if it's dependent. You know, here, this is clearly a polyp because you can see that it's not layering out in the bottom of the gallbladder, but is at the superior aspect and has a clear stalk. And you can see that evidenced on the uh, X plan. Here's a stalk and here's the polyp um, here. Um, recently, and I, I, I think this is why um, Hisham asked me to talk today, we published a paper um, in Annals of Surgical Oncology that provided a critical assessment of the uh, recently uh, updated uh, joint guidelines for the management and follow-up of gallbladder polyps. And this, um, these guidelines were recently uh, published in uh, European uh, radiology. And here you can kind of see the, the schematic of how a uh, gallbladder polyps um, should be managed and followed. Um, it's a, a fairly uh, straightforward algorithm. And what I draw your attention to is the most dominant factor with regards to how you manage patients with gallbladder polyps is dictated, not surprisingly, by the polyp size. And if the polyp is uh, less than uh, 10 um, millimeters, then the next uh, point in the algorithm is whether the patient um, has um, any symptoms or risk factors. The risk factors um, would include uh, patients who are older, greater than 60, whether they have a history of uh, PSC, whether they're Asian uh, ethnicity, um, or whether the um, polyp is a uh, sessile in nature and whether there's any associated wall thickening that's greater than four millimeters. If the patient does not have any of those uh, symptoms, then if the polyp is less than five millimeters, then there's no follow-up that's recommended. If the polyp is between six and nine millimeters, then um, there should be follow-up um, ultrasound and uh, continued surveillance of this polyp at um, six months, one year, and then two years. And the uh, follow-up can only be discontinued after two years if there is um, an absence of any growth. If, however, during the follow-up, the uh, polyp um, reaches 10 millimeters, then one should proceed with a cholecystectomy. Or if the polyp grows by two millimeters or more within two years of follow-up, um, then one should discuss um, cholecystectomy um, with the patient. In contrast, if the lesion uh, polyp is greater than uh, 10 millimeters, then one should proceed um, with a cholecystectomy um, right away. And the reason for this is because the incidence of gallbladder cancer directly correlates with the size of the polyp. And specifically, the reported incidence of malignancy is about 8 to 10 percent in polyps that are 10 millimeters or larger, whereas it's only about 1 to 3 percent in polyps that are 6 to 9 millimeters. And if you look at the literature, the incidence of cancer in polyps less than five millimeters is less than um, 1%, really in the range of zero to 0.5%. Again, I would note, however, though, in patients who have intermediate sized polyps in the range of about six to nine millimeters, if they do have one or more of the risk factors that I discussed, then um, the strong recommendation from the uh, joint guidelines is that you would proceed with a, a cole uh, cystectomy because the risk of cancer would be increased enough that it would warrant that approach. As I mentioned, um, we uh, recently uh, published kind of a, a, a brief overview of these consensus guidelines and a critical analysis of the guidelines um, in Annals of Surgical Oncology. It's a br very brief paper. It's only about two and a half pages and it has a key image with the guidelines. So I would highly recommend that you check this article out. And if it's not available in your library, I'd be happy to share a PDF of the um, article with Hisham, who can then share it with um, all of um, you. I think it's important to talk a little bit about the accuracy of ultrasound for gallbladder cancer. 
because when we do the ultrasound and identify these polyps, we're really trying to figure out, you know, whether they're neoplastic or not. And frequently we'll try to decide whether we need to do some other type of imaging modality, maybe an EUS, maybe a contrast enhanced ultrasound, or when do we get an MRI? This paper is interesting because it shows that basically um, EUS versus high resolution ultrasound in general has roughly the same accuracy as well as positive and negative predictive value. So there does not seem to be any added value in adding EUS to high resolution um, ultrasound in the diagnosis of a gallbladder polyps. And similarly, if you're trying to rule out a gallbladder cancer, again, there does not seem to be any real difference between ultrasound and high uh, EUS endoscopic ultrasound and high resolution ultrasound. So that's why we typically um, use high resolution ultrasound and do not pursue um, in EUS. The other thing that's interesting is that if you look at the accuracy of EUS or high resolution ultrasound with regards to the final pathologic uh, T stage, you can see here in this diagonal, this is where um, the, um, the T stage from the preoperative EUS or preoperative high resolution ultrasound matches the pathologic T stage. And overall, there is fairly good concordance between the preoperative um, ultrasound and the final pathologic uh, stage, whether you're looking at uh, EUS or high resolution um, ultrasound although it is not uh, perfect. And you can see here that the, um, th that the ultrasound is most incongruent with the final pathologic T stage um, for T2 lesions, right? For T2 lesions, that um, there is some discordance with understaging um, with the ultrasound, that the ultrasound is predicting these to be stage or T T1 category when they end up being T2 lesions on final pathology. So the ultrasound can um, be somewhat um, um, deceptive in understaging patients, especially those with T2, T3 disease. The other thing that's important on ultrasound is to look for some key um, features such as calcification um, or um, echo, um, echogenic mucosal um, masses. Um, also, kind of this discontinuity of um, the mucosa, you can see up here in this upper um, right-hand panel with these arrowheads, the thickening of the mucosa um, with the, um, in the gallbladder, and then you can see some stones. You know, most patients who have gallbladder cancer will also have um, um, cholelithiasis, and then down in um, the lower left-hand panel, you can actually see um, a mass with direct infiltration uh, into the liver that is highly suggestive of a gallbladder uh, cancer. On um, CT scan, you can see several things. Um, as noted here, you can see, you know, a kind of thickening again of the gallbladder wall with the gallbladder that is completely filled with stones. In this upper right-hand panel, you can see calcification of the gallbladder wall. And then on these um, other two figures, you can see much more extensive disease with the frank mass in the gallbladder that is extending out into the parenchyma of the liver. So what one should look for is um, a hypodense mass, as you can see here, and then some satellite ptosis. You may see capsular retraction in patients who have had a prior laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You may even see port site recurrence as evidenced by the image in the lower right-hand uh, corner. And then um, one needs to also be aware of subtle changes in the omentum, as well as long, along the pericolic gutters that may be suggestive of a carcinomatosis. But in, not infrequently, you may see nothing at all, especially if the patient has had a recent um, lap coli with an incidental gallbladder cancer and an incidental uh, lesion there may be nothing that is appreciated. Um, for patients um, who um, get an MRI, 
Again, you can see here the thickening of the gallbladder wall and a mass in the gallbladder, and then infiltration of the liver um, with a large lesion here in panel B uh, with biliary dilatation that would represent a mass that is not resectable. So an MRI on a T1 weighted uh, series, one should look for either a hypo intense or an iso intense lesion. And on the T2 weighted images, the periphery may be more intense. And then on MRCP, one should um, look for any uh, biliary obstruction invasion. PET can also be very helpful as this is a very PET avid lesion. And in um, a certain subset of patients, um, it will um, help you identify um, other sites of disease. And some papers have even demonstrated that it can be very prognostically important in getting a PET scan in the setting of an incidental gallbladder cancer, because if it is negative, patients are more likely not to have occult metastatic disease and to have a better long-term prognosis. And some studies have even suggested that a PET scan may uh, change your management in up to one in five or one in seven um, patients. As I noted, PET scans uh, tend to be very, very sensitive um, for both the primary tumor and metastatic disease, and it may change um, uh, treatment in up to one in five or one in four uh, patients. So I will use a PET scan selectively um, in patients who have had um, incidental gallbladder cancer. It really depends on the T stage or the T category of the disease. And also um, if the gallbladder has been perforated at the time of the lap coli, because if it has, I'm obviously much more concerned about disseminated disease. And then also how long the patient has had between the incidental cholecystectomy, gallbladder diagnosis, and when they're seeing me. Because if it's been a long time, then I think there's more of a chance for occult disease to have blossomed. And as I mentioned, you know, peritoneal disease is fairly common uh, with gallbladder cancer and can occur in like 30 to 75% of patients. And it can be very challenging to see on cross-sectional imaging like CT or MRI, because, you know, it essentially is a plaque-like disease that is either um, on the serosa of the bowel or the capsule of the liver and can be missed. Um, and that is why a PET scan or a laparotomy, uh, excuse me, laparoscopy uh, could be um, helpful. And in this one study by Dr. Sharon Weber, um, she noted that 48% um, of patients with gallbladder cancer um, um, had um, evidence of metastatic disease on laparoscopy, um, and especially um, the incidence of finding a peritoneal disease correlated with the T category, as well as nodal status from the initial laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, pathology. And speaking of pathology, here is the TNM staging uh, for gallbladder uh, cancer according to the um, eighth edition of the AJCC manual. And you can see here that T1A and T1B um, are related to its relation to the lamina propria. And then a new introduction was the sidedness of the lesion. So whether the gallbladder cancer was on the peritoneal side or on the hepatic side dictated whether the lesion was 2A or 2B. And that is uh, shown here uh, graphically where you can see that uh, lesions that are on the um, hepatic side, so this pink represents the um, hepatic side, would be uh, T2B lesions. But if the cancer is on the quote unquote free peritoneal side, then it would be a T2A lesion. Now, many of us, um, you know, it's hard to know this, right? Because people take the gallbladder out, and it's not oriented, and someone sends me this patient from a community hospital, and it's sometimes it's hard to figure out whether it was on the, the liver side or the peritoneal side, right? No, it's hard to know. So um, I think if you can figure it out, it's prognostically important, although at least in my practice, I find it to be practically difficult sometimes to really figure that out. Um, so, you know, what do we do? 
what do we do when someone is sent to us for an incidental uh, gallbladder uh, cancer? And as I uh, mentioned, the things I think about is time. So when did the patient have their lap coli, right, where this incidental gallbladder cancer was diagnosed? Was it perforated? So I always look in the operative note, you know, did they perforate this thing? Did they take it out in one piece? Did they put it in a bag? And then I look at like, what's the, what's the stage, right? You know, was it a T1, T2, T3 lesion? What was the node if they got the, you know, callous node out? Because we know that in general, re-resection of these lesions has a, a benefit. Um, and uh, for patients who are uh, T1B, T2, A or B, I would argue, or T3 disease, re-resection with formal um, segment 4B, 5 resection with the lymphadenectomy, these patients have an overall survival benefit. Now I know this is all retrospective data. It's hard to prove a survival benefit between people who got an operation, people who didn't get an operation using retrospective data because there's lots of selection bias. So, you know, we can try to filter out some of that selection bias by you know, looking at it, you know, in a stratified manner. And what you see in this um, uh, slide is that, you know, the overall survival, you know, tracks um, very strongly with the T1 uh, category and that the prognosis after re-resection is uh, T stage dependent. With patients who have T1 or T2 disease, you know, having very good five-year um, um, or one-year survival, um, in a pretty good five-year survival around 60 to 100%. But we note that those patients who have T3 disease, the five-year survival is significantly worse at only 20%. Um, percent. And if we look um, at T2 and T3 disease, again, you can see the uh, pronounced uh, difference in long-term um, survival amongst patients who get re-resected who have T2 and T3 disease about 60% at five years compared to 20% at five years. Again, there appears to be a benefit of re-resection in both patients, but um, the benefit um, seems to be much more pronounced in patients with T2 disease. Now, some of this may be a stage shift phenomena, right? In the United States, what we call the Will, Will Rogers effect, right? Because when you do this second operation, it's essentially a, a bigger staging operation. Um, and um, you're, you're better defining the um, extent of the uh, disease. So, you know, we would all recommend that um, for T1B, T2, and T3 disease, that one should undergo, um, one should recommend the patient a, a more oncologic operation with liver resection and lymphadenectomy. And part of the reason for this is that when you go back for, um, you know, surgery, and this is a paper that we published quite a long time ago, is that you're going to find residual disease not infrequently. And if you look, the incidence of finding residual disease um, goes up pretty significantly with the initial uh, T category. So in T1 patients, at the second operation, you find uh, residual disease in about one third of patients, T2 patients, half the patients, and T3 patients, three quarters of the patients. And it's interesting, in T1 patients, it's mostly going to be in the nodal basin, but then in T2 and T3, you can see that the nodal basin um, incidence of nodal basin metastasis goes dramatically up, but you also will find residual disease in the hepatic parenchymal bed in anywhere from 10 to 35% of patients. Um, so this second operation does um, remove residual disease. And what's interesting is that when you do find residual disease at the second operation, it is a very strong and potent predictor of long-term survival with patients who are found to have um, residual disease at the second operation, having a five-year survival of only about 20%. So going back and doing the separate second operation, it may have a therapeutic effect, but it definitely has a staging effect and allows you to better uh, uh, provide prognosis, uh, prognostic information for the patient, and will also um, dictate whether the uh, patient gets adjuvant uh, therapy or not. And as um, I noted, 
that um, residual disease is a very poor ad, um, um, adverse factor. And um, about 40% of patients who have residual disease will recur within uh, one year. Recently, we published this paper in HPV surgery that used machine learning, so artificial intelligence, to try to preoperatively stratify patients with regards to their risk of prognosis and risk of recurrence uh, following that second oncologic operation. And perhaps not surprisingly, what we found is that those patients who have larger tumors, so greater than five centimeters, patients who have biliary obstruction or jaundice that require uh, drainage procedures, people who have larger, um, who have higher uh, CN19-9 levels, and those patients who have a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio uh, greater than 1.5 all have significantly um, worse uh, prognosis and about 40 to 50% of them will recur within one year. So that kind of begs the question, do we need to rethink our approach, right? If we have these patients who present with gallbladder cancer, even incidental gallbladder cancer, and we can identify a cohort of patients who after the second operation will recur within one year, perhaps these patients are better off treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, right? And um, this is a kind of a seminal uh, paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that um, looked at doublet therapy with gemcis versus a uh, gemcitabine and showed um, a benefit of doublet therapy over monotherapy and uh, these data combined with the new bill cap data would suggest that patients who are high risk should be treated with adjuvant therapy, either with gemcis or capsidabine. But really, um, we think that there's probably a rationale for treating patients with gallbladder cancer with preoperative chemotherapy who are at high risk. So high initial T stage, you know, maybe suspicious PET scan, or who meet the criteria that we identified um, on our machine learning study, big tumors, high lymphocyte uh, to neutrophil ratio, high CA19-9. Because giving preoperative chemotherapy may help reduce the incidence and treat any residual micrometastatic disease, as well um, as improve patient um, selection and help identify those patients who have underlying metastases already and allow that tumor biology to manifest itself and spare these patients a second operation. So this is a, a clinical trial that my colleague, Dr. Mattel, um, who's pictured here in the corner, is the primary investigator on that is currently open in the United States. This is for patients who have incidental gallbladder cancer, um, who get baseline imaging and a pathologic review. And um, if they are uh, deemed to be eligible for enrollment, so they have some of these high risk uh, features um, and are deemed to be at higher risk for early recurrence, then they're treated um, either with surgery upfront um, or they're treated with neoadjuvant therapy with GEM plus CIS um, uh, based on the uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper that I showed you. Then they get restaged. Everyone gets a staging laparoscopy. Um, and then, um, then patients who got upfront surgery get adjuvant therapy. And patients treated with preoperative gem cyst following re-resection re get consolidation therapy with gem cyst uh, postoperatively. And then um, the patients are followed with the primary endpoint being overall um, survival and then um, the secondary endpoints being uh, the presence of any residual disease and progression-free survival. So we are accruing to this trial. This makes a lot of sense to me that um, we try to use neoadjuvant therapy similarly to how we do it with pancreatic cancer to better identify those patients who have adverse biology and will not benefit from a second operation versus those patients who have good biology and may indeed benefit from that second operation if, do they, if they do not manifest progression or metastatic disease um, following neoadjuvant therapy. 
So um, with that, um, I'll conclude my comments. Um, I want to thank Kasham again and all of you for your very gracious invitation to join you virtually today to talk a little bit about gallbladder polyps and gallbladder cancer. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions. This is our hospital here in uh, Columbus, um, Ohio. You can see in the background, that's the city of uh, Columbus. Uh, the city of Columbus is about 1.1 million people. It's about the 15th largest city here in the United States. And then in the forefront, you can see um, our new hospital. This large building is our cancer hospital. And then the building under construction in the forefront is going to be a 27 um, story high, 1.1 um, million square foot new university hospital um, in which we will be delivering uh, state-of-the-art uh, medical and uh, surgical care. It is my hope um, that I can one day visit um, you all in Egypt, as it is also my hope one day that you may be able to visit me here in Columbus, Ohio. So with that, I'll conclude. Hisham, thank you again. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Tim. Uh, let's see if you have any question from the audience, please raise your hand. Any question, raise your hand. Guess it was pretty straightforward, huh? no questions. <laughs> no questions. Either I put you to sleep or I answered all your questions up front. Yeah. <laughs> the second. Yeah, we have a question from Dr. Gamal Amero. Yes, please. Uh, good evening. How are you? Uh, sorry, I haven't uh, listened from. I I haven't uh, uh, attended the, the the first slides. I I have a, a simple question. When I have uh, a cholecystectomy done, I don't know whether you have uh, mentioned this or not. If I have a cholecystectomy done without serosal infiltration, without nothing, and we found carcinoma in situ or early, do we have to, to do anything else or this is uh, okay? But, yeah, so I, if, you, if you just found carcinoma in situ, then I, I, yes. wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do anything because carcinoma in situ is essentially stage zero, T-I-S. Um, and even if it involves only the lamina propria, T1A, then I still would just simply watch the patient. Current guidelines are that only patients who have T1B, which is invasion of the muscularis, T2A um, or B or T3 disease need to undergo a second oncologic operation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for clearing that. If we have any other questions, please raise your hand. A question from Dr. Mustafa Shazli. If you find small peritoneal disease. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, so I, would you proceed? I, yeah, that's a good question. So if I stuck a scope in and I found peritoneal disease even around the area, I assume that means like, you know, even on the hepatoduodenal ligament, right? Or maybe the duodenum or like around a little bit around the area, right? The, the gallbladder fossa, I, I probably want it, right? I, I, I just think, you know, like the clinical trial I showed you, I don't see the downside to just removing the scope, sending the patient home, right? Because they go home the same day, putting them on chemo, you know, for like three to six months and then coming back and doing the operation later. Because it, 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 if, if, you, if they blow up with disease and carcinomatosis like all over the place while they're on chemo, it's likely there's no operation that would have helped them in the first place. Um, and so, you know, I think that as they always say, you know, biology is king. 
um, and surgeries, maybe prince or princess. It's not even the queen, you know, and I guess, you know, the, you know, so that, that I would just wait. Carcinomatosis, as I've showed you, this is such a bad disease with a horrible prognosis. I think really with systemic therapy would be better. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, that's about it. <laughs> okay, that's great. So thank you, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we have oh, one more question. Yeah, one Let's more. see if we can. So he says uh, that I'm, I'm, the window. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you hear me, Sham? Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the worry of losing the window of doing resection uh, with a new adjuvant. Uh, what what do you think about this? Yeah, I'm not worried the window about of resectability. I'm not worried about the window. So this is this is what I think. Okay, I always think is something borderline resectable or borderline unresectable. Okay. No, I, I mean if it's if it is resectable. No, no, no. Hear me out. Hear me out. So you know, it, the only time I'm worried is if I give chemo. I'm not talking about gallbladder cancer for any other cancer. If I give chemo and if it grows and then technically it becomes not resectable, right? Then, then I've missed the window. That's a technical window. But I'm less concerned about, we're talking about a biologic window here. So, you know, you, you're not gonna cure the patient by surgery. It, it's gonna take a multimodality approach. And if they have peritoneal disease, they need chemo right? They, they need chemo. They're, even if you resect them, they're going to need it afterwards. So my point is, why not give it to them up front? Because that way, the biology will sort itself out. Because if you have peritoneal disease, and you give chemo, and then they blossom, they, you know, take off, then, you know, you didn't miss the window. If anything, you missed getting your head caught in the window. Because you know you're likely to have like operated on them, then you give the chemo, then they get diffuse peritoneal disease, and then you did an operation that was never needed. Do, do you know what I mean? So I that, know, but no, I mean, I mean regarding uh, without peritoneal disease, which is localized to the good bladder. In case of I mean resectable, I mean uh, uh, T2 uh, or T1. Uh, oh, you're talking uh, about not talking about those with. Non-incidental gallbladder no, cancer? No, and no. After I mean, after uh, cholecystectomy and proved to be uh, malignant, uh, but T1 or T2. Yeah, I mean, without peritoneal disease. Without peritoneal disease. Oh yeah. Yes. So right now, with I'm sorry, without peritoneal disease, if they were T1B or T2, then I, I think it's fine to take them to the operating room and do the operation. Yeah, I thought you were suggesting that you saw this. No peritoneal disease, right? I think on, on a trial basis, right? Accruing to trial, right? You know, patients who have T2 disease, especially on the liver side, because those patients have a worse prognosis, T3 disease, or patients who have TNEN1 disease, then I think, you know, giving those patients chemo first could potentially make sense. I also think if someone has like a T2 cancer and you read the operative note and they ruptured the gallbladder, taking it out, I'm, I'm very worried about those people, right? Because I mean, those patients, as you know, like within like three, four months, they can explode with peritoneal disease. So sometimes I'll be like, let's give you some chemotherapy because it was like big time spillage. What about the N1 if you have a positive news? Uh, on pet CT, uh, would you go and resect or not? Um, I, I, you know, I would tend to favor giving chemo first. You know, I, I'm a big neoadjuvant chemotherapy guy. You know, I always tell patients it's not the disease that we can see that's going to kill you. It's the disease that we can't see that's going to kill you. So, you know, taking out that node now or taking that node out three or four months from now, that's not going to change the patient's prognosis, right? I find it hard to believe, you know what I mean? Like the, how, yeah, give the patient chemo, 
see how they do, then take it out. So I'm still saying do surgery, but biology is your friend. Uh, if it's stable and not progressing, but not improving or regressive uh, after a new adjuvant. I take it out. Proceed? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. and what about micrometastasis or oligometastasis if you have one metastasis in the liver? Yeah, that's, uh, a, good, that's, away... a, that's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. So I have given those people, people chemo for like longer, maybe like six months. And right. I have resected them. I have to say that long term, they've come back. You know what I mean? So have I done it? Yes. Um, I can't think of any patient where they eventually it didn't come back. What about the portocaval lymph node? Because sometimes uh, they, uh, it's, it's resectable, uh, but do you consider it it's an N2 or uh, uh, still a portipeds lymph node? Yeah, that's another good question. So, I mean, I kind of think, you know, you know, nodes like, in, you know, station like 12 and, and 9 or about hepatoduodenal ligament. If people have like aortal cable lymph nodes or celiac lymph nodes, you know, then I'm much less willing to operate on those patients. I'd want them to be heavily pretreated with chemotherapy to demonstrate stability of their disease and likely would only operate on them if they've had no progression, if they have stable disease, they've been on chemo for at least six months, maybe more, and they have good performance status. You know, they're younger and you're, you're trying to be like aggressive, you know, like not an 80 year old or something like that. Um, because clearly I think, you know, if you have second or third echelon lymph nodes, the prognosis is worse and the likelihood that you're gonna cure that patient goes down dramatically. Regarding the ex, can I ask an, another more question? Sure, go for it. Yeah. Uh, regarding the extra hepatic, uh, uh, I mean the, the common bile duct resection, would you depend uh, on uh, uh, the decision to excise or not on the distance uh, of the uh, from the cystic duct? Yeah, that's I mean, if it's in the, yeah. in the fundus, would you go and do as well? Resection of the extra hepatic uh, uh, common uh, biliary or not? Yeah, you, you had a number of good questions. That's a great question, too. So, in general, you know, I don't routinely do an extra hepatic bile duct resection. If the cystic duct margin was negative um, yes. on, on the, you know, incidental cholecystectomy, then, then I don't do yeah. anything. If, if, if it was positive, then sometimes when I go back in, people have left like a really long cystic duct. And then, you know, I will like re-resect the cystic duct flush with the common hepatic duct. I will mark it. I will send it off for frozen pathology analysis. If it's negative, I won't do an HJ. But if there's a question and the cystic duct is positive, then I will do, you know, a, a common bowel duct resection and a hepaticojejunostomy. And you do as well frozen for the lower and the upper limit of the common bile duct uh, while you're resecting. Yeah, I mean, most uh, of it, for most the of the, limit. Yeah, most of the time it's the lower because that's all that matters. Like yes. the upper limit has a clip on it from the cholecystectomy, right? The lower limit going into the common hepatic duct is what matters. But at sometimes it, uh, it, it, it involves as well the right hepatic uh, duct. Well, I mean, if it involves a right hepatic duct, I mean, I, I have, I think what you're alluding to is sometimes patients can present with gallbladder cancer in jaundice. That's typically what they're involved yes. right hepatic duct. Yeah. That is a strong contra, you know, relative contraindication to surgery. You know, jaundice has been reported in the literature over and over again as a very poor prognostic factor. And, and, and if they have jaundice, sometimes they require an extended right hemihepatectomy because you're right, you know, that involves right hepatic duct then you got to take out like, you know, segment, you got to go into segment 4B and it's a big operation. So, you know, you can do that, and I, 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 you know, but I think you have to be very selective in patients who have jaundice 
you know, drain the biliary tree first, make sure their jaundice is under control. And if they have a large parenchymal mass, then um, I would treat them with a preoperative chemotherapy too, before I took them to the operating room for some big, you know, surgical uh, resection. But if it's, uh, if it's attacking the right hepatic duct and uh, you will be able to get a free margin uh, at the sectorial ducts uh, with excisions of common hepatic duct, I think uh, you will treat it as local, uh, as uh, clad skin. If it's, uh, I mean, it's involving on the cystic plate and the right hepatic duct, why should you go for uh, uh, total right hepatectomy? Well, you can try, but you I can mean, get a free margin. If you can get it, you can get it. But I also think, I mean, I teach the residents, if you have a mid-duct lesion, that it's it's typically, it can be gallbladder cancer or, or like you're describing this right hepatic duct. It could be a perihylar tumor though too. So sometimes it's hard to figure out whether there's something like growing down from the hilum or if there's something growing up from the infundibulum I think also there can be like tracking of the tumor along the, you know, the, um, um, you know, nor perineural. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can get a negative frozen margin in the operating room, but then the final pathology comes back as positive when they've looked at it a lot closer. So, yeah, I mean, if you can get above the duct on the right and you can cut it, you feel confident you have a negative margin, you could do that. Um, you're going to have to do a double barrel anastomosis because you're, you're above the bifurcation, right? Because if you cut the right, you know, sure, yeah. um, but I just think, you know, in general, that's fairly uncommon in my experience, because in my experience, when that has happened, it, there's also like a mass there, you know, that's invading segment 4B. It's not like you have like this isolated lesion in the biliary tree, because that's a perihylar usually gallbladder cancer that's involving, you know, the right hepatic duct, in my experience, is like some type of mass associated with it. And then you're kind of into this, like, I got to do a liver resection also. So I'm just saying, in my experience, I, I don't do many kind of like chasing it back to the sectorial branches and doing some HJ. It's like, you know, either it's like an HJ at the bifurcation or it's an extended right. Yeah. And would you sometimes do, uh, or you're forced to do WIPL as well if the lower margin is negative, is, is positive? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I would be loath to do like a liver resection and a pancreas, like a Whipple for a gallbladder cancer. I mean, technically you can get it done, but, you know, even in um, experienced hands, the morbidity and mortality is significantly higher, even in experienced hands. And the prognosis is is much worse. So yeah, I mean, I think you you know you got to use clinical judgment, but yeah, you can, I chase it down distally, and sometimes you know you can't get a negative margin in the head, and then I think you just have to make a judgment call like how old's the patient, how good is the performance status, what response did they have to preoperative chemotherapy if you had given it, what was your preoperative CA nineteen dash nine, was it like a hundred thousand? If it was, then I don't know if I'm going to do this operation because that, you know, we know that tracks with prognosis. Was it normal? You know, so I think those are all very nuanced and complex decisions. So, yes, you can do it. You know, I've probably done like a couple of those, but I am not super enthused about combining a big liver operation with the Whipple. You know, again, I think, you know, doing a Whipple and going high up on the bile duct. Yeah, sure. No problem you know, doing a big liver resection and going low down on the bile duct, sure, no problem. Doing an extended right or some big liver resection with the Whipple, I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah, technically you can get it done. Yeah. But I frequently said, you know, operation went fantastic. Patient didn't do that great. You know what I mean? Like sometimes like- I faced it twice. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had to do a pancreatic because the lower margin was positive. positive. So how'd the patient do? Uh, they are go doing well. One of them is uh, four years now. Yeah. Uh, which, alhamdulillah, thanks God, and he's uh, still alive. <laughs> the other one as well is uh, three years or two years. That's great. 
gallbladder cancer or, or a high? Or yes, uh, uh, incidental, after a section of gallbladder. Okay. Okay, good. Yes. If you have the, the, the tumor on the peritoneal surface, you should remove as well segment four and five, or, or you do wedge from the four and five or not? Well, technically, if you're sure that it's uh, it's uh, on the uh, on the peritoneal uh, surface. Technically, no. But in reality, I do it because I mean, for me, it's you very it. difficult for them to be a hundred percent sure it was on the peritoneal side, unless the gallbladder was done at your institution and someone inked it. You know what I mean? Um, and, and you depend as well on the frozen section of the wedge. Uh, what what would depend? You depend, I mean, on the resection of the liver wedge. Of, no, uh, I, don't do, I don't do frozen sections on the wedge. I mean, I, I mean, I think you remove all four and five or you oh, just uh, uh, take a wedge of the liver. I take a big wedge of the liver. I mean, I don't do like, you know, a formal. I'm not like, you know, the Japanese with the ultrasound, finding the segmental branches, injecting, you know, into size right. in blue and lighting it. You know how they do it, you know, and they really do a true, true anatomic resection. I more take a, you know, kind of a big, for lack of a better way of putting it, like shark bite out of like segment four B and five and just reset the gallbladder fossa. Right. Yeah. And you don't do a frozen for that. I mean, they're cut margin. I don't do a frozen. Not unless I'm like worried about something like there's a mass or something looks goofy. Sometimes when you're in there, right? It'll be very fibrotic and it'll be hard and you can't tell is it cancer, is it just post-operative changes or you know, from the last operation, then I might do a frozen. But in general, I just do a big wedge of segment 4B5, gallbladder fossa, clear out all the lymph nodes and, you know, uh, station 12, hepatoduodenal ligament, the retro pancreatic, that retro portal node that's always there, and then clean off the um, common hepatic artery and proper hepatic artery. Can I take the opportunity to ask you about something else regarding the biliary as well? Sure. If you've got a, a, a Klutzkin-like tumor, which is a, a biliary, a hilar biliary structure, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, should you take, I mean, should you have a liver a, a, a tissue biopsy before going to resect or not? You can try, but I mean, you know, I think you know better, you know, the same as I do. And that's why you're asking. Sometimes it's very difficult to get a tissue diagnosed. Yes. Even doing like right. fish and all this other stuff. And what yeah. I have seen sometimes is that people, you know, keep trying and trying and trying. And like, meanwhile, like if it looks like a cancer, you know, maybe I'll check like an IgG4, right? Cause you don't want to do yes. a big operation. And you realize, oh my God, this was like, you know, idiopathic, like, you know, inflammatory disease. But I mean, I think at some point, you know, if you can't get a tissue diagnosis, they have a normal IgG4, you know. So you do you do IgG4 as a routine? Not as a routine, no. But I'm just saying that's the only thing sometimes I'll, because who cares? It's a lab value, you know, because I have, I've done a Whipple for a couple, you know, uh, I, you know, people with high IgG4s where we thought it was a distal cholangio. And then we got it back and there was nothing in the friggin', you know, uh, there was nothing in the specimen, you know, it was the wrong diagnosis. But in general, I'll try to get a tissue diagnosis maybe a, one or two times. But, you know, if it looks very suspicious for, our, you know, a clat skin, then, you know, I tell the patient, you know, we don't have a tissue diagnosis, but, you know, I, I think I have a high suspicion this is cancer and I recommend surgery. Uh, yes, I, I do agree totally with you because... I first uh, phased one time I've done uh, right hepatectomy and unfortunately I didn't do IgG4 before and it proved to be uh, IgG4 cholangiopathy after resection. It was free and, uh, and then I tested for the IgG4. It was found to be uh, uh, significantly high. So I started to do a routine in... Uh, but even the type two uh, uh, autoimmune, the IgG4 is negative. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Interesting questions, interesting cases.
Great. Well, this was um, really good. I appreciate all those questions and that robust discussion. It's always so much fun to talk about actual cases and have some back and forth with folks. So this is great. So, Sean, anything else? Uh, no, I think that was it. So thank you, Dr. Pavlik, for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you with, with us. And uh, if you have the time, we definitely look forward to more and more with you. With you. Yeah, that'd be great. Hopefully, maybe I can visit sometime in 2023 or 2024. We just get have to get it on the calendar, like, you know, in a year in advance. Um, but uh, I, I will let it. you know. I will all right, my know. friends. Stay okay. well, stay healthy. And I look forward to chatting more in the Thank future. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.